Today we are officially kicking off our spring stewardship campaign that goes through the month of, of April. The theme this year is sustaining generosity. And uh, Mark and Casey Clymer are the chairs for this year's campaign, so I'm grateful for their work. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking to yourself, didn't we just do a campaign here like five or six months ago? And the answer is yes, we did. And that was a capital campaign. And it was a successful capital campaign. We raised $8.3 million in three-year commitments. But this is our stewardship campaign that we do every year to support the mission and the ministries of our church. We are going to break ground this summer uh, on our new addition to the South, which will house more children's classrooms, a new chapel that will, uh, where the contemporary service will be, but also smaller weddings and funerals, and we're excited about that. Uh, but now we kick off our stewardship campaign that happens every, uh, every April. And um, there's three reasons that we have a stewardship campaign. And this is important because this is a part of what it means to understand Christian discipleship. The first reason is that faithful stewardship is a very important part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 9, those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly, and those who sow bountifully will also reap bountifully. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Secondly, we simply cannot run this church without your ongoing support. And all of our generosity is what makes the ministry, the life, the mission of Woodmont Christian Church possible on an ongoing basis. And so uh, every year we have to remember that all of us play a role in making this happen. And the third reason we do this is we ask for commitments every April from our members so that we can responsibly set our operating budget. Uh, Woodmont last year had roughly 370 commitments in the stewardship campaign. I think it was like 374. We have a $3 million operating budget. We're happy to show it to you anytime you would like to see it. And um, interestingly enough, we had about 370 commitments to the capital campaign, which was uh, a very pleasant surprise um, because usually you don't have that many capital gifts. So we're very thankful for the generosity of this church. Everybody has different giving abilities. Everybody has different incomes. But giving back to support Christ's church is a big part of what it means to be a Christian. And again, this year's theme is sustaining generosity. We've had some great years at the church, and we want to continue that as we move ahead into the future. Today, we are moving ahead in Luke's gospel. During uh, our Lenten series, we're moving fast because we only have six weeks, but today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 12. Last week, we talked about the parable uh, of the Good Samaritan, and today we move ahead to Luke 12. Luke tells us about a man who comes up and he asks Jesus to arbitrate a family dispute. You guys ever have family disputes in your uh, families? Apparently there was a fight between two brothers over how to handle the family inheritance. And uh, just for the record, uh, family inheritances can bring out the best in families. I'll say that uh, as, a, as a preacher. But Jesus refuses to get involved in this family dispute but he takes this as an opportunity to teach, which he often did. He said this, he said, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he gives a parable. A rich man had a land that produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do because I have no place to store up all these crops? So he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones where he could store up all the grain and the goods. And he says to himself, soul, I now have ample goods laid up for many years to come. I can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God says to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. You know, money is a funny subject. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But it's a subject that if you read the Gospels, especially Luke's Gospel, you'll find that Jesus talked about it a lot. Money and possessions, giving and generosity. Over the years, since I've been a, a minister, I've made just a number of observations about the subject of money as it relates to our culture, <clears throat> as it relates to our faith. And here are a couple of those observations. We all have to deal with money. 
on a regular basis. It's a universal reality. We, we all pay bills, we pay mortgages, we pay insurance premiums, utilities, we buy clothes, groceries, and lots of other things. We all can relate to these teachings because we all deal with money. Secondly, money and lifestyle expectations are the number one cause of divorce within marriages today. And I see it all the time. And I tell all the young couples that I get to work with that they need to communicate openly and honestly about money issues. Because if they don't communicate about money in their relationship, then it will lead to problems. Number three, children grow up heavily influenced, for better or for worse, by the way that their parents deal with money and, and, and teach them about money. Some of you heard me tell that story about Clayton. We were giving him a dollar a week to uh, take down to Sunday school for the offering. And, uh, and then one night we found uh, uh, a bunch of those dollar bills in his bedroom at home. And we asked him, we said, you know, Clayton, uh, where did this money come from? And he kind of looked and we said, well, is this the money you're supposed to be giving to uh, Sunday school? And he looked and said, well, why did you keep it? And he said, because I love money. I wanted to keep it. The most honest response I've ever had from a, from a member of Woodmont. <laughs> Number four, the way we spend, the way any of us spend our money says a lot about our priorities. Our money and our time, our bank statements and our calendars are moral documents whether we want to admit that or not. It shows us our priorities. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Number five, it's always been the case that there are those who have lots of money and pretend like they don't have any, and there are those who don't have any money but pretend like they've got a lot. As Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. Number six, I learned this from my father, money makes a great servant in life but a terrible master. Paul writes to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. Number seven, in our culture, many people have come to believe that net worth dictates self-worth, which is a very scary thing because there are lots of people who are very wealthy, but they are morally bankrupt. And money does not buy you character in life. And the last observation that I've made over the years, greed and fear are two very strong and powerful emotions that drive the way human beings act and interact in general. And Jesus was very, very aware of this when he, when he taught these parables and his different teachings. Now back to the parable of the rich fool this morning. Let's ask the question, why was this rich person called a fool? Was it simply because he was rich? I don't think so. Here are the reasons why I think Jesus called him a fool. The first reason is he cannot see beyond himself. He's selfish. He's completely self-absorbed. He's only concerned with what he can do to store up his grain and his crops and his stuff. It's all about him. And he's simply not worried about anybody else. His attitude is the opposite of what Christ calls us to do because instead of denying himself, he is aggressively affirming himself. It's been said before that Jesus Christ came to banish the words I and mine and substitute we and ours. And yet we live in a culture that is very self-centered, and we all know that. Instead of trying to find happiness by giving things away and helping others, this man tries to find happiness by hoarding and keeping everything to himself. He's probably thinking to himself, you know, who knows? When, when times will be bad? Who knows when uh, another drought might come? Who knows when I might need all this stuff? So I can't give any of it away. I need to hold on to it. He's selfish. Yesterday, there was a, uh, a talk that my wife, Megan, went to. Uh, a couple of women in Nashville, and I'm probably going to get their names wrong, Clea Scherer and Joanna Templin, started this company, and now it's become a New York Times best-selling book called Home Edit. Have you all heard of this? I'm sure some of you, uh, some of you moms have. And they were speaking over at Harding Academy, uh, and, and, and basically the, the whole theory of Home Edit, as I understand it, my closet is now a lot cleaner than it was before yesterday, um, is that these women come into your house, and they will, whether it's your pantry or your closet or some other room, they will help you organize it 
and get your life uncluttered and, and, and more organized. And they've built a business, started in Nashville, and now they're in like five or six different cities around the country. And they wrote this book that has climbed the New York Times best-selling list and is apparently just doing great. But isn't it interesting how all of us could admit that, that there is a part of our lives where we have way too much stuff, stuff we don't need, stuff we'd never use, but yet we have some kind of an emotional attachment to our stuff and we just can't seem to part with it or, or, or give it away. There's a whole industry in our economy now that builds buildings for people to store their stuff so they can pass their stuff along to their kids and then their kids can deal with it one day when they're not here. All of us sometimes have too much stuff and yet we don't want to part with it because we have some kind of an emotional attachment to it. Clearly this man in the parable of the rich fool didn't want to part with his stuff. The second thing about this man, the reason I think Jesus called him a fool, is that he's not able to see beyond this world, beyond this earthly life. All of his plans are being made on the basis of this earthly life and, and the reality is, if we only find ourselves thinking about this earthly life, then we will become obsessed with our possessions and our stuff, and we'll want to hold on to it, and we'll want to accumulate more and more and more. Enough is never enough. Now, let's address the elephant in the room this morning. This parable makes us uncomfortable. To be honest with you, a lot of Jesus' parables make us uncomfortable, and I think that's a good thing. This parable flies in the face of a culture that tells us that we should try to get ahead, work harder, save more, invest more, have more, and then one day you can relax and retire because you've stored up enough stuff or enough money, and the earlier the better. And let's be honest, life is expensive. Having children is expensive. Living in Nashville, Tennessee right now is expensive, a lot more expensive than it was three or five or eight years ago. Even people that are already in retirement sometimes wonder, am I going to outlive my money? People are living longer nowadays. One of my advisors at Suwanee, a guy named Bill Brissend, he's preached here at Woodmont before, he did his, uh, his doctoral work at the University of Chicago and he wrote a book on the parables. And this is what he says uh, about the parable of the rich fool. He says, what makes the man foolish is not what he did and said, but the attitude that was at the root of his decision-making process. He decided as one who only lived for himself and thought that, 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 that he would live indefinitely. It's not that rich people will die and poor people will not. It's that rich people sometimes have a way of living as if they think they will never die. But they will. And if they wait until then to discover that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, it will be too late in all kinds of ways. Jesus is simply trying to remind us of what life is all about. Our lives do not consist in the abundance of possessions. Possessions are nice. Possessions are fine. They're fun. We enjoy them. But that's not what life is all about. Life is about love. It's about family. It's about relationships and having friends. It's about showing compassion to other people and empathy to those who are struggling. It's about uh, 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 giving to people who are hurting and who are in need. And there's all kinds of need on every single socioeconomic level. Life is about honesty and character. It's about learning the importance of moderation and balance. It's not about living in fear and worrying all the time about everything that may or may not happen. You know, David Brooks talks, talks about resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues help us in the marketplace. Eulogy virtues are what preachers talk about at your funeral and, and ask questions like, are you a good person? Are you a good husband, a good friend, uh, a good spouse, uh, a good mother or father? Uh, do you care about other people? Those are the eulogy virtues. And yet we would have to admit that we live in a society that gets so obsessed with resume virtues and what you can, what it takes to get ahead and to get a better job and to earn more money and to get the next promotion that sometimes, sometimes we neglect the eulogy virtues, which are really, really important. 
If we continue on in Luke's gospel after this, this parable, what do we find? We find Luke's version of the passage on worry, just like in Matthew. He says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what your, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Isn't that interesting? Money and worry are often back-to-back in the Bible. What made this man foolish was not that he was rich. It's that he was rich, and he had convinced himself that he didn't need to help anybody else, and he was going to keep it all for himself. And I love that line, I don't know who said it, but there's no smaller package in life than somebody all wrapped up in themselves. Now there is a connection between human survival and our inclination to be selfish. And I think we have to do everything in our power to push back on that. Fear is what can lead to greed. Fear is what will keep us from sharing We have to live our lives in a way where we trust that there will be enough. And even when we're generous and we give some away, we have to trust in God that there's still going to be enough. There are three phrases that I'll leave you with this morning from this passage today. Three phrases that really jump out at me that I think define this parable of the rich fool. The first one is this. Take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed. You ever notice how... how It's everybody else that's greedy. Rarely will we point to our own hearts and say, be more generous. It's always the one who has more than we do that we point to and say, that person is greedy. Second phrase, your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What? Your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. That's what the commercials tell us. That's what, that's what our culture tells us. The, the person with the most toys at the end of life wins. But Jesus says, no, that's not what life's about. Warren Buffett, who's one of the world's wealthiest men, says this. I find this interesting. He says, the only way to measure success in your life, do you know what it is? It's not your bank account. It's not your net worth. It's not your toys. It's this. Do the people that you love and care about love you in return? And if they don't, then what good is all the stuff? Third phrase, the last verse. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. Work hard, make money, plan for the future, but then take some of what you have and give it back and help other people. All of us, every single one of us, will wrestle with and be stressed over the subject of money. And Jesus speaks to that multiple times, including this parable. The question, the question is, are we listening? Amen.